Okay. So. Yeah, we <laughs> will make you go. <laughs> All right. So um, I briefly understood uh, what uh, Paulino said about me. So I'm gonna reintroduce myself. <laughs> so um, my name is Fodis uh, Hanzis. Um, I uh, I have uh, sp uh, been working in the information security industry for uh, many years. Uh, lately, my focus has been on uh, uh, IoT and IOMT, uh, the Internet of Medical Things. Uh, so my current job is w working at a big clinic where uh, our day job is uh, conducting vulnerability assessments, penetration tests uh, on medical devices mostly. So what we do is that we bring in the medical device, we collaborate with the manufacturer, with the vendor, and we bring in uh, a test system, we set it up in our laboratory, and then we inspect everything from uh, software to network to hardware. We take the device apart, we disassemble it, uh, we you know, inspect debugging ports, um, everything. So um, we get to see a lot of cool stuff, uh, such as um, you know, implantable pacemakers, uh, in drug infusion pumps, um, MRI scanners, CT scanners, everything. Uh, even surgical robots. Uh, that was one of the most interesting assessments. Um, my past includes some network security research. Uh, one of the highlights was uh, exploiting uh, the TCP persist timer, which was uh, focusing on uh, exploiting an inherent vulnerability in TCP. Um, I'm also involved with uh, Nmap. I used to be a Google Summer of Code student um, back in 2009 and 10, and then I became a mentor for the Nmap project. As a student, I wrote NCRAC, which is the network authentication cracking tool of NMAP. Uh, I still try to maintain it when I have free time. And uh, recently, uh, uh, as uh, Paulina mentioned, uh, we have also been involved in the IoT GOAT project, uh, whose purpose is to basically create a vulnerable firmware uh, so that you know, students can play with it and learn a lot of the common vulnerabilities in uh, IoT systems. Um, and uh, I've also published a video course on mastering Nmap um, and uh, some of the you know, uh, common stuff there, certifications and all that. You all know these things. Um, so our, our agenda, what? Oh yeah. <laughs> so we are also writing a, a book on IoT security. Uh, Paulino is also one of the authors. Uh, so all of these, you know, pieces uh, together with um, our job and, um, you know, the medical devices and the IoT GOAT project. So everything uh, recently revolves around playing with IoT. And this is also the subject of the current talk today. Uh, so uh, as you know, the S in IoT stands for security. Um, so you know what that means. The Internet of Things has no S. And... Um, uh, the protocols that we're going to see and inspect today are uh, all of these, uh, from DICOM to ONVIF to IPv6. Uh, all of these you can normally see in IoT ecosystems. And uh, we're going to be focusing on, uh, uh, on mostly the network protocol side of them. Uh, so we're not going to be talking uh, about hardware or uh, things like that. Uh, we're going to be talking, let me see here, I think this needs some... Correction. Okay. Um, so I, I like mostly uh, researching network protocols uh, from the um, uh, design uh, side because whenever you find a bug there, a vulnerability, it is inherent. It is you know embedded in the in the protocol itself. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with the implementation. So an example was the DNS Kaminsky bug from you know uh, ten years ago or so. Uh, this was a fundamental flaw in DNS. Uh, it wasn't just an implementation issue. And the similar thing was the TCP persist uh, timer exploitation that I uh, talked about briefly uh, before. So that was a denial of service attack, a generic way to exploit uh, the TCP persist timer, which is an inherent mechanism in TCP, and it's everywhere. So it doesn't have to do with uh, how TCP is implemented in Windows or BSD or Linux. Uh, it's how the TCP protocol itself as a theoretical thing uh, is, uh, is designed. So whenever you find something uh, like a problem there, it's really hard to fix, so the impact is much greater, 
and you don't expect it to be fixed uh, so soon. Um, so it takes it takes all the vendors, you know, a lot of collaboration. Like the DNS uh, thing, it took many months of collaboration among Cisco, Microsoft, and all these other big companies to be able to solve it. Um, the other thing is that uh, the the attacks on on the protocols. Uh, you know, they, they mostly are applicable everywhere. So it's not about, you know, finding a bug in Apache, uh, like a specific version of a software or whatever. And uh, the design problems can also point to weak spots in the implementation. So later we're gonna talk, for example, about the WS Discovery Protocol, which was also, by the way, some of the uh, exercises in the workshop today, um, earlier. And you can see there that uh, there is a fundamental flaw in how the protocol itself uh, is, uh, assumes a lot of trust in, in the local network participants and how we can exploit that to conduct some other attacks uh, on the implementations themselves. So let's start with uh, one of my favorite um, protocols. Uh, it's a pair of protocols, actually. So it's MDNS and DNSSD. Uh, MDNS, the multicast DNS, uh, is basically a protocol that is used in local networks. Uh, it works similarly to DNS, uh, but uh, it's used mostly for auto-configuration of uh, devices on the network. So that's why you see it a lot in IoT ecosystems. Uh, you get to see that in, um, you know, home networks, corporate networks, everywhere where you have to have uh, uh, zero, conf, uh, zero configuration networking. So uh, one of the, um, just a brief intro introduction, it uses the source uh, and destination UDP port of, of 5353, um, because 53 is the, the one for DNS, so it's easy to remember. Uh, the IP, um, it's, it's uh, multicast, so it uses uh, some uh, multicast addresses for IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, the dot .local domain, whenever you see that uh, on uh, Wireshark, uh, it's basically the local domain for MDNS. It can also resolve global names too, although this isn't really used uh, normally. Uh, but whenever it does, it's another attack vector. And uh, it has the two phases, the probing and announcing. We're gonna talk about them later. And we're gonna see how uh, we can conduct MDNS poisoning, which is similar to uh, other attacks on the local network, such as ARP cache poisoning or DNS uh, uh, cache poisoning, and how it works on the, in the case of MDNS uh, and the Bonjour protocol by uh, Apple. DNSSD is... Um, uh, also, uh, a ser service discovery for uh, DNS. It goes hand in hand with MDNS, so you usually see them working uh, in collaboration. Um, the way that this works is that um, whenever you want to, to see about a, a service on the network, you, uh, you send a DNS PTR query. The PTR is the pointer record. Uh, you see that normally in DNS. And then the replies are this triplet, the pointer, uh, service, and TXT records. Again, we're gonna see an example later, so you don't have to uh, remember this. Um, and uh, the service record in specific, uh, you can see that uh, it has some, some information that is uh, important for the exploitation. So it has the target host and port, and uh, the host name then is uh, resolved by the, uh, the common DNS uh, A or uh, four A's for the IPv6 equivalent. And let's see how this is in uh, practice. So you can see, uh, I hope this is visible to the people uh, back there. Uh, so the, the probing phase initially is uh, what the, um, whenever a device uh, gets on the network, it needs to first uh, send some probes to see if there is another device with a similar uh, host name uh, already on the network. So in this case, the, let's say we have a printer. Uh, again, this is like a uh, common in IoT environments. Uh, you connect a, a printer on the network and you want to automatically uh, discover it. So what it does is it sends this probe and says, does anyone else have um, this host name which I want to take for me, for, for the printer on the network? And if nobody replies in the next couple seconds, 
then it announces uh, itself on the network and says, okay, I'm going to take this, uh, this name now. And the next, um, the next phase is the announcement phase. Uh, so uh, when, when, it's, when it's there uh, and doesn't any longer, um, and there is no other uh, host on the network that has this name, then the printer sends uh, all of this information there that you send, that you see. Uh, it's unsolicited, which means that it doesn't, um, it, it just sends all of that without expecting something in return. And uh, the, the main point there is the, the PTR service, the pointer service and TXT records, this triplet, you always see, see that uh, highlighted in there for the test um, underscore IPPS, in this case, um, uh, host name. And then you also have the, um, the other uh, records, the A record, which resolves the host name that we saw. Uh, in this case, the, the test dot IPPS and so on, that resolves to the IP address of the, um, uh, of the current uh, printer. And then, um, let's, see, let's see a scenario. In this case, uh, let's see uh, whenever you have, um, uh, let's say you have a MacBook that wants to print a document. And uh, the system has already pre-configured a network printer named test. In this case, uh, we are examining the Bonjour implementation of the MDNS and DNS SD protocol. It's, it's almost the same, uh, but Apple has some specific uh, you know, assumptions. Uh, and th this, is, this is the scenario. So the, the fact that the system has already pre-configured a network printer might uh, might make somebody assume that this is harder to exploit because I, you already have configured the printer. So how would you be able to exploit that? But the, the thing is, and this is one of the main design flaws of the MDNS, is that, um, and it's highlighted there, it is, it is irrelevant if the service has been discovered in the past. So. The fact that you had pre-configured the network printer to have this, uh, the, that the test name, test IPPS, whatever, uh, is already configured in the MacBook client is, is totally irrelevant. Because, uh, why is that? Because we want flexibility. The, the protocols uh, themselves are not designed for security, they're designed for being flexible. And why is that? Because what if the host name uh, of, the, of the network printer or the IP address of the network printer uh, changed at some point? Because you know you disconnected from the network, you connect it again, and somebody has already taken the, the host name or IP address. Uh, MDNS wants to take that into account. And so every time that the Mac client wants to connect to that printer, it asks again using the MDNS and DNS as the protocols. It asks again, where is the, the test uh, dot IPPS uh, uh, host name? And that's one of the flaws that we are going to uh, exploit to perform the MDNS poisoning. So in this case, um, the, the Mac client will always be sending a new MDNS query asking where the test service is. So you're going to see that that's part of, the, um, of a Wireshark uh, traffic. Uh, these are the requests that the MacBook uh, client sends on the network to ask for the, um, where is the test service. Then in the next step, uh, the printer, uh, so let's say now we have the legitimate uh, scenario where we don't have an attacker yet. So the printer will then reply in the same way as, uh, as when it was in the announcement phase. So it will say, uh, here is the triplet pointer uh, service and TXT records, and here is the um, A uh, record, and all of this together uh, will be more than enough for the MacBook client to understand and identify where the printer is. So in specific, the TXT record in the printer's response uh, also will contain uh, the URL for the printing uh, server. So that's also an important thing to, to note for, uh, because you can do some extra things in the attack later. So 
Uh, now that we, that we have all this information, the macOS client knows, uh, first of all, the IPPS uh, TCP local with instance name test. This is the pointer record. Uh, that This is on uh, TCP port uh, 8000. This is from the service record that the ubuntu.local resolves to this uh, IP address specifically. This was the A record from the reply and uh, from the printer. And the URL to post print jobs is uh, this specific one. And this was in the TXT record. Um, so with all of this information, the macOS client now knows everything. It, it has asked where the uh, test IPPS uh, service is, and it has all of that, and it can now connect to the, to the printer. So let's see how the MDNS poisoning works now. Um, so it's, it's really simple. The attacker listens for uh, multicast uh, MDNS traffic on you know, the classic uh, UDP ports 5353. Uh, now, every time that the, the macOS client needs to print a document, uh, since we said this is a fundamental flaw of the MDNS, it will send again the, the query to, to ask where the test uh, service is. The attacker then can continuously send back replies to poison the, the client cache, and it will say that, you know, uh, this, this, is the, this is me that has this name, it's not the, the printer. And the thing is that uh, I, I'm, I'm mentioning there that you have to win the race, so you have to, to send the reply back to the um, uh, to, the, to the macOS client before the real printer does. But as a matter of fact, you can, you can easily uh, win the race if you have already started sending the traffic before the macOS client uh, even asks for, the, um, uh, f for where the test service is. Because it doesn't matter, you can just uh, keep uh, flooding the network with, uh, with those replies. And at some point, when the macOS client wants to know about this information, it will have the reply ready because you are already sending this uh, kind of uh, uh, network packets. And um, uh, in this case, the client uh, will send the document to the attacker and then as an attacker, as a man in the middle, uh, you can forward, you can steal the document and you can forward it to the printer uh, and the macOS client will not even know that something uh, happened. And at this point, we have a demo. So let me get the video. So just to give an idea before I uh, push uh, play, um, on, the, on the right pane, on the right uh, part of the screen, you can see an emulated uh, printer. And uh, em it's emulated uh, using the IPP server of, uh, of Linux. This is a common way to emulate printers. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's not a real printer, it emulates all the functionality of a printer. Uh, on the left side, you have the attacker. Uh, so in the temp directory there, we uh, do an LS first to see that there's nothing there, so we don't have any documents. And um, then we also uh, start an IPP server uh, for ourselves as an attacker, so that we are able to receive a document when we perform the uh, MDNS attack, and uh, in the in the console on the uh, on the top right on the top left part of the screen uh, is the uh, Python uh, script that does the poisoning. Initially, you won't see it running, so you're gonna see um, the network traffic as the macOS client starts uh, sending a, a document to the legitimate printer. So let me see. So there. You have, uh, this is the, um, the connection output from the legitimate printer as the macOS client um, uh, connects to it and sends a print job. And now uh, we are done with that. Uh, the, the document has been sent to the legitimate printer. But now uh, we're gonna start the poisoning attack and then uh, the macOS client will also start uh, we'll start another uh, uh, print job, but in this case, we are the ones that receive the document. And you're gonna see after I, I've, this is all the, the connection from the uh, MacBook as it connects to us instead of the, th 
thing. And there you can see, now we have the print job in the temporary directory. And this is it, this is a very simple attack. It works out of the box and there isn't any, any easy fix for that. So next protocol, uh, IPv6. Uh, IPv6 is important for IoT ecosystems because um, as you know, IPv4 addresses get exhausted, uh, it's about time that IPv6 will be more prevalent and will be used everywhere. Um, one of the issues uh, that we have seen, especially in medical devices, uh, is that often IPv6 is overlooked. So the other day we were testing uh, one really critical medical device. And uh, one of the things that we saw was that although everything was filtered for IPv4, uh, for IPv6 everything was exposed because obviously the manufacturer had overlooked the fact that embedded Linux systems uh, also listen on uh, IPv6. So you could, you could do all sorts of th things uh, against IPv6, um, and it was it was really bad. And the other the other thing is that until recently, uh, and this is an important distinction uh, for when you read the RFC of uh, protocols. Uh, you know how in uh, in RFCs, which is you know the official specification of uh, all these protocols, uh, the the keywords uh, really matter. So if there is a must and a should. Uh, they are quite different. So must is whenever you implement the protocol, whenever you know all these companies that want to have this protocol uh, enabled in their uh, operating systems or devices, uh, the must means that in order for the protocol to be implemented correctly, uh, it always has to be this way. But should uh, is something that is not mandatory. So sometimes it's a good idea to have it implemented, but it's not necessary. So whenever you see should in RFCs, then that means that there might be uh, this feature, but there might not be. So IPsec uh, changed it, uh, IETF, which is the commission for, uh, for these protocols, uh, changed it and make it more lax. So this means that IPsec uh, is not something that you're gonna see in IPv6, although IPv6 also has some, some of its own encryption. Um, so uh, w one of the other things that uh, you can do with IPv6 is that all of the attacks that uh, work in IPv4, for, uh, especially for the local network, such as the, so what do you have in IPv4? You have the ARP cache poisoning, which is very common on local networks, and you have the ICMP uh, redirect attack, which is a way, this was normally implemented again for performance reasons, so whenever you are on a network, you have uh, many routers, and uh, a router can send the ICMP uh, redirect message uh, on the network, and the clients that are on the network must follow, uh, must then send their traffic to that router. And this is sent whenever you want to, you know, uh, have like more than uh, one router, and for performance reasons, you want to direct traffic through a second one. But also, obviously, this, is, uh, this can be exploited by an attacker because you can send a, an ICMP uh, uh, redirect message and say, send all your traffic to me and I'm gonna forward it because I'm, I'm like a legitimate router. And the same exact thing works for ICMP v6, which is, um, uh, you know, we were expecting to, ha to have some better security with IPv6 and the, as a matter of fact, we do. Uh, but still, you can see things like this um, still work. The other problem is IPv6 extension headers are a complete uh, mess. I'm pointing there to uh, some good research uh, from a security uh, guy who has done some really cool work with uh, IPv6 extension headers, so you can do all sorts of cool stuff, such as uh, bypassing uh, access control lists on uh, firewalls um, by just... Um, exploiting the complexity of extension headers. And um, 
The other thing uh, that also works is the for the NDP. Let's see here. Let's. So instead of having the ARP, um, yeah, there is this neighbor discovery protocol uh, in IPv6, and there is an exact attack that you can perform there, which is the neighbor cache poisoning. These are all known attacks, so you can find a lot of information about them and how they work. Uh, again, these are all fundamental vulnerabilities in the protocols themselves. It's not an implementation bug. It's something that works anytime, anywhere. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about uh, smart homes, IoT sensors, and cameras. Uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, protocols here. Um, as you can see, smart homes are not always that smart, especially in terms of security. Uh, so one of the um, uh, common protocols there is the all join protocol. Uh, so this was made uh, basically so that there is interoperability between a lot of uh, different uh, systems uh, that you normally find in IoT ecosystems. Uh, it's, uh, so let's say, for example, you have a light bulb, a smart lamp that wants to talk to a, to a network hub so that you, when you want to control the smart home from your phone, um, you, you can do that easily. So the all join network is basically an abstraction layer uh, for all of these devices so that they can use that instead of, you know, just having their own uh, proprietary protocol. And uh, all join is open source and um, it's actually been out there for quite some time. Uh, recently they made some, uh, some good, uh, added, they added some good security features, but still there is room for exploitation. So I'm highly I'm highlighting there some of the risks. Uh, this is more theoretical, uh, but these are, these are things that do work uh, in practice because, for example, the header correlation, um, although part of the all join protocol is encrypted, the header uh, part is not. Uh, so you can, you can uh, extract this information to find some, some interesting um, topology things. Then there is uh, the concept of sessionless signals, which are also unencrypted and unauthenticated. So again, you can do a lot of um, spoofing attacks. We're going to see an example uh, with the WS discovery. The concept is the same. Because you have all this uh, zero configuration concept, uh, you, you, because you sacrifice the automation, you sacrifice security for automation, uh, it, you cannot have authentication, you cannot have um, uh, easily, I guess, authentication. And um, uh, you're going to see what I mean with the WS discovery, which highlights this, this concept. Uh, deadlocks, another thing, because all join is quite complex. Um, you can see, um, basically, you can perform resource exhaustion attacks, denial of service attacks, uh, because of the, um, a lot of parallel method calls are, are there. And uh, there, there is uh, the concept of multi-point uh, sessions. Uh, so you have the same symmetric encryption uh, key for all of the um, participants. So there, if you have one of the participants is a malicious uh, entity, uh, it can basically use the same key to, to, uh, to communicate with the rest. Um, IoT sensors, uh, one of the, we have also uh, examined a lot of those. In the uh, in, in healthcare environments, so for a tempera from temperature monitoring uh, to things such as uh, HVAC systems uh, or um, camera systems, uh, so one of the common things that we have found there is that most of these uh, protocols, uh, most of these systems, they use unauthenticated, unencrypted protocols. So if you just you know start capturing network traffic over the wire or over wireless, whatever they use. They use some kind of proprietary, uh, usually XML, um, over TCP or UDP. And you can do pretty much anything with it. So you can replay attacks. Uh, you can do a replay attacks, and you can send uh, you know, modified information about the temperature. So you can say that you know, this sensor um, says that the temperature is something completely different, and then the system might you know, assume that there is a heating uh, problem. Um, and the, the, main, the, main, uh, the main problem when they make these systems is that there is this behind the firewall mentality. So the vendors, when, uh, when they de designed those systems, they uh, assumed 
that they are behind the corporate firewall and everything's safe there. So that so they don't care about security. But of course, this isn't the, the case. Uh, or weak encryption. So we have seen uh, custom encryption algorithms, which is uh, which were basically encoding things. Or um, unauthenticated debug network service. So they have a listening port uh, that is still enabled in production systems, and you can send uh, information. You can do uh, memory. There are usually a lot of memory corruption vulnerabilities there. And then for mobile apps uh, that connect to these uh, IoT sensors, they are usually overprivileged, which means they ask for more permissions than they should. Uh, so you can see that why does a mobile app that you know controls the uh, the, the lamp of your home, why does it need to access your whole f uh, mobile phone file system? So there is a lot of potential for malicious uh, applications there. And let's, uh, let's talk a little bit, this is uh, again one of the interesting parts, uh, IP cameras. Uh, an example of vulnerability that I really like that we had found um, um, some time ago was that uh, you could look into the HTTP server configuration files of the IP camera. There was this skip auth keyword uh, for specific URLs. And we found out that, and this was after gaining access to the firmware. So a lot of these systems, you can find the firmware online. It's usually unencrypted. You can download it, I mean officially from the vendor site. You can uh, use tools such as Binwalk to extract the whole file system. And then you can, uh, you can see how the you know, the files are structured and what uh, kind of configuration there is. So that's what we did, and we realized that those URLs that had this specific um, uh, skip auth keyword uh, were basically without authentication, so you could just type the URL for the camera, and one of those, uh, it could let you take uh, snapshots. So imagine you're on the network, you can access the camera just by a specific URL, and this was supposed to be a security camera, so go figure. So this was also part of the, the workshop today. Uh, we had some exercises there. Uh, so ONVIF is, uh, again, an interoperability standard. Uh, it's basically a way for uh, all these IP network cameras to be able to support the same, uh, to speak the same language, let's say, uh, whenever they, they talk with each other and with uh, camera server software. And there is uh, this uh, protocol uh, called the WS Discovery, which is the zero configuration part of the ONVIF protocol. So the scenario there is that you have, uh, usually, especially in corporate networks, you have a lot of cameras. Like, say you have a big company, you have put cameras all over your, uh, uh, your facilities, and you want to be able to see all the video feed from a centralized uh, server. So there, there, are, there is this uh, IP camera server that needs to speak this WS discovery protocol uh, so that you automatically discover a new camera that you add on the network. And uh, it's very simple how it works. Uh, so uh, it's basically SOAP queries over uh, UDP, over UDP port uh, 3702. Uh, it uses a multicast address, so initially, uh, so, by the way, just to not complicate things, uh, this, is, uh, this figure is from the standard itself. Uh, the client part there, you can assume that it's, it's actually the IP camera server, and the target service is the camera. So, uh, whenever a new camera, a legitimate new camera gets added to the network, it sends a hello uh, multicast uh, uh, probe that announces its uh, presence. You can see how this, all of these zero configuration protocols like the, um, like the MDNS have the same concept. They, they have this assumption that everybody is a good participant, is, a, you know, is not malicious, and there is the concept of announcement and probing, uh, very similar to WS Discovery. So uh, the server then sends whenever uh, periodically, it sends these probe queries on the multicast address there, and uh, ev everyone on the network that um, uh, wants to announce, wants to make their presence known to the server, uh, they have to reply back with, uh, to the server now, not, not to the multicast address, to the specific IP address, with, uh, with a probe match, as, as we call it in uh, the WS Discovery uh, lingo. So um, you can see an example here. Um, 
Basically, the, the, the main um, uh, problem there is that, again, anyone on the network can announce that they are a legitimate camera, which isn't really the case. So uh, the only uh, problem, the only, uh, let's say, a thing you have to do as an attacker is that you have to listen for the, the probes, the multicast probes on the network uh, that are from the IP camera server. And then you have to extract uh, the, uh, a specific message ID from the XML. And then in your replies back, uh, you, can, uh, you must send the same message ID. And when you do that, uh, here is an example of, um, of, uh, of an IP camera server uh, called uh, Camelytics. So, uh, this is uh, th you, you can see there in the um, screen to the um, in the right part of the screen you can see that there is a new camera there but this new camera is not a, a real one it's uh, a, a rogue camera that an attacker pre pretends to be so uh, it, it works very simple as we said we are listening for um, for WS discovery messages you can see the, that from the console there we receive something from the server and then uh, we have to just parse this uh, little XML message there. We have to extract the message ID, uh, which is basically a U UUID uh, thing. Uh, you can see there that that's what we do. And then we are sending the, you know, evil in quotes uh, packet back to the server, which is nothing else than uh, what a legitimate camera would uh, send back to the server to announce its presence. So if you're wondering what you can do with that, these are all the attacks that you can perform. So when, when you pretend to be a fake, uh, a, a legitimate camera on the network using uh, exploiting this, uh, this flow, uh, one of the most common things is that uh, there are a lot of memory corruption uh, bugs in the software of the IP camera servers. So one of the things that I had found uh, in the past when testing some of these uh, enterprise solutions was that you could send, you could fuzz the, you know, the, the replies back to the server and the server could crash. And optionally, you can also code a remote code execution there. The other thing is that you can impersonate a real camera and uh, you can do that, of course, by either uh, doing a denial of service on the real camera or winning the race against it. So whenever uh, you are, whenever the server asks uh, if there is any legitimate camera on the network, you reply with the exact same information that one of the legitimate cameras would send. And in this case, uh, only the, the, your fake camera, uh, your, the attacker's camera, uh, which isn't really a camera, but just the payload of your uh, exploit, will appear on the server. So in that case, you have uh, legitimately uh, performed a denial of service on the real camera because it will never appear on the, on the server's list. And what you can do with that, you can replace it. So you basically are saying to the server that you are the, the real one. And as a result of that, you can send artificial video input. So you can emulate the whole uh, video camera service and you can send you know, this Hollywood style uh, thing that you can see whenever they perform robberies that you send uh, uh, still image of the same place instead of the the real one. So this is actually possible using this this simple trick. Um, and the other thing is that you can capture credentials. Uh, and the way this works is that whenever an operator adds a, a, a camera on the um, on the IP camera server, they they must also send some of the username and password for the legitimate camera. So whenever you are, you pretend you are the real camera, you can capture those. And you can use those to you know, gain access to the rest of the cameras, which most likely will be using the same username and password because there's a lot of uh, credential reuse in uh, many of these cases. Um, the other thing is that you can send malicious link to the operator, um, the, you know, the, the human being that is behind the screen and manages the, the camera server. Because uh, inside the match probe, there is uh, some room for specific uh, links. So there is the, you know, uh, you can send the URL that points to, um, you know, some kind of malware. 
And then there's the concept of the discovery proxies, which is an interesting uh, part of the WS discovery protocol that is often overlooked. So this is basically just a, a, a REST uh, web server that allows you to perform these kinds of attacks that normally work only on the local network uh, over the internet. So this is something that uh, is uh, an interesting uh, research uh, point. Um, RTSP, RTP, RTCP, uh, why bother and what's wrong with them? These are also used by IEP cameras everywhere. By default, they're unencrypted. Um, there is no message authentication or integrity. And uh, the, the more secure equivalents, the SRTP and SRTCP, are still not widely adapted. I have never seen SRTP in even enterprise cameras, so that says a lot. And uh, what you can do with that? Uh, so one of the things that I was uh, researching was, uh, yeah, you can, you, as a man in the middle attacker on the local network, you can capture uh, all, all of this RT, RTSP, RTCP, RTP traffic. Uh, that is basically uh, the video feed of the camera that travels from the camera to the IP camera server. And um, we don't have to go into detail, but I wanted to mention the fact that there are these simple steps, and I couldn't find uh, anything that works lately, at least. There are some tools out there. There was, uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, one, uh, some guys that also had presented at DEF CON a few years ago, some tools that automated this, uh, this process of uh, basically playing back the video from a captured uh, wiresack uh, for a captured uh, traffic. Uh, but I managed to do that uh, by using these uh, five simple steps. Uh, which is basically you need Wireshark, RTP tools that you can find in, those, uh, in that link, and FFmpeg. And the only thing that you need to do is that after you have the pickup dump, as, as a man in the middle attacker, you have, the, uh, you have to export the packet bytes from the SDP portion, you have to do some modifications on the SDP file, and then you can use FFmpeg in RTP play uh, to play back the video file. And I, I performed this attack recently just to demonstrate how, you know, in a corporate environment, they assume that, you know, something just because it's un unencrypted doesn't mean that it's unsafe. But if you can show them that, yeah, here's the video, here is something that is playing right now, and we, because we have captured the traffic, you can watch the, the whole video, uh, this, again, is, is another thing that uh, makes some people get scared. Uh, I don't have a, vi a video for that yet, but... <laughs> uh, so, uh, let's talk about the, uh, more specifically about the IOMT environment, uh, the Internet of Medical Things. So, um, an interesting attack vector there that uh, was also recently, not recently, but maybe a year and a half ago, was the implantable devices. Um, and how you can access those from a home monitoring device. So the scenario is this. Uh, somebody that has you know, a heart um, uh, issue, they usually have these implantable devices that regulate their, uh, their pace. So they're usually pacemakers. And these are, th these are uh, installed inside the patient. So they have to perform surgery and have this device inside them to regulate their heart. And usually they have to replace it every 10 years because that's when the battery gets exhausted. Uh, so it's a, it's a big thing. And the thing is that um, these devices, they send uh, usually diagnostic data to a home monitoring device, as they call it. So this home monitoring device is a, a simple system, an embedded device that resides uh, at the patient's uh, home. And it, it communicates with the implantable pacemaker inside the, the chest of the patient per periodically, so maybe uh, a few times per day or once per day uh, over, the, over a wireless protocol, obviously. And then the home monitoring device sends data to the cloud so that the physician, the doctor, can, uh, can see if there is some kind of anomaly. So if they, if they see that there is a specific pattern that might uh, lead somewhere, uh, might lead to a heart attack, for example, they're gonna call the patient to their office, so they're gonna, you know, do some more in-depth analysis of their health. Um, 
And this is, uh, this is um, for, for the home monitoring device to send data to the cloud, there are two ways. Uh, it can use a, a, a mobile connection, so it will use 4G or uh, something like that. Uh, there is also, actually there are three, there, there is also a possibility of using a landline uh, by connecting a, a module that connects directly to the, to the telephone line. And the other uh, way is to use a common wireless uh, connection, so some kind of WPA2 uh, that connects to the, to the router of the home network of the patient which then connects to the cloud. And of course there is the whole concept of if you manage to attack the um, uh, the home monitoring device through the, the router, so if you have gained access to the patient, then you can also potentially gain access to the uh, pacemaker itself. So the implications there are, um, are great because of you know, what you can do whenever you uh, access a pacemaker. Um, so uh, there, there has been a lot of research uh, that is publicly posted out there that you can see some, some of these attacks. I'm just raising the awareness here. Um, we might have performed or might not have performed some of these attacks, I cannot say, but these are some really cool stuff. And um, so some of the common vulnerabilities that we see, this is a huge list, we're gonna go um, fast. Uh, one of the biggest issues is backdoor accounts. We see that all the time, hard to credentials or encryption keys. So because the manufacturer thinks that we're never gonna do reverse engineering on their binaries, that everything is safe, but of course we always do reversing and we find these things. And then of course the same thing can be done by a nation state or uh, somebody that has a lot of time and resources. And whenever that gets leaked, then there isn't any easy way for the, for the hospital to, um, to, to, to change them. So whenever there is a hard-coded credential that gets found, then it can be abused by attackers and uh, do whatever the, the, the credential allows them to do. Uh, default passwords all the time from admin admin to uh, all your common passwords there. Um, there, is a, there is a lot of times where you have web application, uh, common web applications with all, again, the common uh, flaws from uh, SQL injections to cross-site scripting to uh, everything. Services running with excessive privileges, we see that all the time. Uh, everything has to, to run with a system on Windows or with root. Of course, if you exploit any of these services, then you get automatically system privileges or root privileges. Um, so outdated OS and third-party libraries, this might seem a bit boring, but as a matter of fact, with medical devices, uh, there is a big problem with how you, you patch them. Because, uh, for example, in the US, you have the FDA, this regulatory uh, government uh, organization that needs to approve every medical device uh, before it gets to the market. So this process is really long. Uh, it takes you know, usually months, maybe sometimes years. And by the time the, the device hits the market, so that is available for commercial usage, everything is outdated. So the, the device might have been designed a few years back and it might still be running Windows XP, for example. And the other part of the problem is that you cannot just apply a patch on a medical device because it might break the device itself and might also break the approval of the FDA or whatever other uh, regulatory organization. So the other day um, that I was talking with some, some vendors, uh, they are making this uh, blood analyzer. So this is a common device that, you know, whenever you do a blood test, any kind of blood test from, uh, you know, just to see your uh, uh, cholesterol or if you have like a, an infectious disease, uh, a blood analyzer is what is doing the main work. And these are also can be connected to, to the network. And he was saying, the, the engineer there was saying that um, whenever we have like a security issue with any of these devices, we have to go through uh, months of rigorous testing before we apply the patch. Because if anything in the patch breaks anything in the software, in the embedded software of the blood analyzer, then like, you know, a floating point operation that, you know, gets, uh, propagates an error, uh, then you might have wrong results, which is a big deal for 
when you are a patient. And then, of course, you know, the implications for the company that makes this device are, are huge. So if, if you have, um, uh, I remember one of, the, one of the first big bugs on um, vulnerabilities uh, were on this X-ray machine that was many years ago that was configured because of a floating point uh, operation error was configured in such a bad way that the X-ray radiation dosage was much, much higher than it should have been. And of course, people could get, and I think some people had gotten cancer because of that. So imagine you, you, you go somewhere to diagnose cancer uh, or whatever else, and you get cancer because of that. But that was, that was a long way back. So we haven't seen that <laughs> recently. So that's good. But on the other hand, yeah, the, all of these vendors have to be really careful with uh, all the testing they are doing. Uh, but, but this leaves a huge time window between whenever a vulnerability get, uh, gets published and when the fix is applied. So uh, again, a very uh, popular example of that was uh, with a WannaCry attack. Uh, if you remember, if you had read the news when that happened um, a year and a half ago, uh, was that the NHS, the National Healthcare System of the United Kingdom, was basically completely decimated by this, this attack. So the, you know, the malware uh, could infect all the SMB uh, ports out there on Windows system. A lot of the, those medical devices, they might be running uh, Windows. And, uh, you know, surgeries were canceled. Appointments were, uh, were, had to be rescheduled. So it had real world implications just because of uh, you know, a, a vulnerability on Windows. And many of these devices couldn't be patched in time because many of, the, of those systems had to first get approval from the vendor, from the manufacturer of the device, that everything will work uh, as it should after the patch is applied. So all the hospitals had to wait, had to wait a long time. And of course, this leaves a, a big time window for uh, attacks such as the WannaCry to take place. Um, so uh, another, another uh, issue is, uh, I mentioned that before, custom encryption algorithms, they think, some, some vendors think they are smarter than the best uh, uh, cryptographers out there and the best mathematicians, so they think that they can make their own encryption algorithm, which of course never works, as it should. Uh, lack of anti brute forcing protection, um, so, in almost all cases, there is no brute forcing protection, so you can run tools such as NCRAC or uh, Hydra or whatever else, and you can try to brute force, especially for the default credentials. Uh, a lot of times they have network ports accessible that they shouldn't have, like for services that are not even used or mandatory, essential for the functionality of the device. Then there's the whole issue of the protected health information or the... Um, or, or other sensitive information for the, for the patients uh, and how this is stored in the medical devices. This is especially important because, again, in the US, there is this HIPAA Act, which uh, says that whenever there, there's a data breach uh, at the hospital, uh, the, the hospital or the clinic has to uh, announce that to the government. And of course, this is a huge reputational risk for the hospital um, because PHI is, is also uh, a really big target for um, cyber criminals, um, like on the black market, uh, protected health information is, is much more uh, worth it than, for example, credit cards. And the reason is that uh, the patient history of someone is, doesn't change. So the credit card, you can just cancel it, you can call your bank, and it changes the, the same day. The, your patient history, like if you have a disease and if you have something, doesn't change. It, it has a much longer uh, shelf life than, uh, than any other information. So that's why it's, it's worth so much in the, in the black market. Um, and especially for uh, high profile targets. Uh, so for example, if you have a clinic uh, that you know, um, celebrities or uh, you know, government officials regularly go as their you know, to-go clinic, um, this can be a target of, of especially for this kind of uh, information. Uh, insecure communication channels, uh, again, everything, a lot of unencrypted protocols, and hardware debug interfaces, you can find a lot of uh, JTAG uh, and similar uh, ports 
uh, that you can access to gain uh, either a shell on the embedded device or just um, extract the firmware or do other sorts of, um, find other sorts of information that can help you um, uh, hack the device. And some interesting vulnerabilities that uh, we have found. Uh, this was, the first one is uh, one of my favorites because it's really uh, subtle, but it can have a huge impact if you think about it. So they were generating uh, a password, but the entropy was reduced because they weren't first uh, uh, in doing some encoding on the bi binary to text encoding. The, they were doing direct UTF encoding, so some characters were, uh, were basically uh, dismissed there. And because both the server and the client were doing the same thing, there wasn't an issue in uh, the communication. But as a matter of fact, just because they were doing this stupid thing, uh, you could, the passwords that were generated by this algorithm were uh, more predictable, so you could crack them more easily. Uh, unauthenticated network services, again, we have seen a lot of those. DICOM, we're going to talk about this uh, in a few minutes. I'm not sure how much time we have. Um, so how much time do we have? <laughs> None? 15? 15 minutes? What? OK, 10. Um, so uh, DICOM services, DICOM is a, is a very complicated protocol, uh, both a file uh, protocol and a network protocol. And there is a lot of, uh, all the libraries that implement DICOM are broken. Um, let's, let's actually jump to the DICOM, so, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, and this is the last part of the presentation. So uh, PAX servers are um, uh, picture archiving and communication systems. They are basically media servers. Uh, in uh, hospital networks, you have a lot of diagnostic images. Uh, so whenever you do uh, an X-ray or a CT scan or an MRI scan, you have these very, very high resolution images. It, they can be uh, gigabytes of, uh, in file size. And uh, these are usually in the, they're using the file format of DICOM. And uh, DICOM is both a file format and a network protocol. So the PAX server is basically a, a software that can both store uh, images in the DICOM format and can also uh, communicate through the network using this uh, DICOM protocol. So it's, it's a really uh, unique type of uh, protocol, I would say. Um, and the, the, some of the big issues there is that um, uh, there isn't any authentication. Uh, it's 99% it's of the time unencrypted, so I, I've actually almost never seen anything uh, encrypted, although DICOM does support uh, TLS. Uh, a lot of the most PAX servers do not support it. So um, you can easily, again, do man-in-the-middle attacks and uh, extract PHI, uh, patient information. And uh, since there is no authentication, the only concept uh, that you have to find is uh, two things, uh, the application entity title, uh, so this was part of the exercise in the workshop earlier that I did. Uh, one, the first part was that you can use, um, I, I have made a module in NCRAC for DICOM that does exactly this thing. So it basically brute forces the application entity title and uh, sends this uh, associate request, which is uh, one of the first steps in the DICOM protocol to communicate with a PAC server. And after you find this, uh, you have to find the second part of the authentication in, in quotes, because this isn't really authentication. There is no concept of username or password. Uh, you have to find the other part of the uh, allowed uh, application entity title. And again, you can brute force that. But the thing is that because these steps are separate, you don't have to do those uh, at the same time. You can first find the server application entity title, and then you can find the client application entity title. And uh, many of the PAC servers, they only check these two things. And if you know these two th things, then you can start extracting uh, patient information from the, from the server, from the PAX. So uh, this is a, an example of running uh, NCRAC against um, the, uh, one of the PAX servers. So uh, by just running this simple command and uh, having a, a dictionary list uh, that is proper. So um, another uh, idea there is that you can use 
uh, permutations of the host name of the of the pack server because usually that's what they use as an application entity title uh, name uh, so and you can you know use uh, some variations of that so for example you can add numbers you can uh, uh, you know add some small words after or before it and it, it's very easy to find so uh, you can find the first part uh, by using ncroc and then you can uh, have a simple um, brute forcing script such as this uh, in Python using the PyDICOM uh, library. And basically what this does is that after you have found the first part of the equation, the, uh, the application entity title of the server, uh, you have to find the allowed application uh, entity title of the client, so the one that the pack server will let connect to it. And you can do this by using this uh, simple script so it will try to basically brute force. And um, by, by using these two, you can, uh, you, you can extract uh, protected uh, health information. So again, it's, it's a big deal for, uh, for hospital networks. And there was uh, this research, be before I, I go there, let me see, I think I have a link. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I mentioned uh, this, I have this link there. Uh, this is from a story that was posted on a Washington Post about uh, an Israeli company that uh, they, they performed this uh, kind of attack on, uh, on DICOM. So the, what they did was that they had, uh, again, uh, a man-in-the-middle um, attack on the local network and they could uh, very easily add uh, information on the images that were tra getting uh, transmitted on the network. Uh, using DICOM because it's unencrypted. There's no uh, integrity check, so you can also modify the images that are um, sent through the network. So what they did, uh, it, it's, it was very simple. They just added or removed uh, cancerous nodes on the images that were transmitted through DICOM, which again, as long as you have access to the network, it's very simple to do. But they they did this just to raise the awareness that you know this has real world implications. So whenever you you know, you, you rely on a protocol that is unencrypted, uh, you can have things like that. Um, because these are all diagnostic images. And, uh, and the last part is uh, about malware in DICOM. So this was recently published by a security researcher. Uh, and I, I think this is a very interesting attack vector. Uh, so again, the DICOM is a very complicated protocol, and um, it has all of these um, uh, all of these headers that uh, many of them are unused. So, for example, you can use some of those to embed uh, portable executable uh, the Windows uh, executable files inside the DICOM uh, inside the DICOM file, and then you can create a hybrid PE DICOM file that uh, can also be executed. So th this was, you can find some information there on the, on the links. Um, this is something that I think needs more research. Uh, and it's a very interesting attack vector because if you have malware, if you have something that infects a DICOM image, then there is the whole issue of what, uh, how can you uh, protect against that? Because uh, let's say you have a lot of diagnostic images that get infected by this kind of malware. You cannot just, you know, quarantine the, the malware like that because these images contain also useful information. They are diagnostic information for real patients. So you, you cannot just delete the DICOM file. You cannot just uh, modify it easily. So it raises a whole new issue of uh, how do you deal with this once you have like a malware that propagates and infects all of your DICOM files with, uh, with itself. And uh, yeah, this is the, the last slide. Uh, these are all the resources that uh, are mentioned in here. Most of them are, um, you know, the main standards. Uh, and there are a couple of links uh, inside the slides. Um, I think we're gonna publish those soon so you can easily uh, see them yourselves. And I think that's it. Do we have time for questions? No? Yeah? Okay, <laughs> one question. Hi. Um, regarding the WS discovery protocol, uh, apart from the man in the middle and 
The replay attack, have you tried something like XML injection to maybe take control of the server, of the cameras to, for remote code execution or something like that? Something further than just make the camera appear uh, on those XML? So uh, one of the ways to do that um, it was one of the, the first steps uh, of the attack. Um, basically, you have to exploit the fact that uh, this, the camera server has uh, XML parsers, and us usually those are implemented by broken libraries. And uh, we have found in the past vulnerabilities that um, use, uh, that lead to memory corruption on the XML uh, library of, of the IP camera server. So using that attack vector, yeah, you can do even remote code execution. But you, you have to do this extra step. It's not like just from the protocol itself. But it, it's an interesting attack vector because uh, the, the server will continuously probe uh, the network for, uh, for cameras. So you can also continuously send back the corrupted replies uh, that may contain something that, you know, eventually leads to code execution. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Cero preguntas. Muy bien. Eh, un aplauso para Fotis. Okay. Thank you.